Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Councilmember Steve Levin. I'm filling in for Chair Moya this morning. Uh, we are joined by Councilmembers Costa Constantinides, Rory Lansman, Andy Cohen, Donovan Richards, and Barry Grudenchik. All are from Queens except for Andy <laughs> and me. Um, if you are here to testify on projects on our calendar for which we are hearing to not already close, please fill out a white speaker slip with the sergeant at arms and indicate the name of the applicant, application which you wish to testify on on that slip. Um, we're going to be hearing this morning a number of items. We'll start the hearing with land use 253, the Hebrew home application for a special permit to allow long-term care facility use in an R11 district in Riverdale and Councilmember Cohen's district in the Bronx. The long-term care facility use would facilitate the development of a continuing care retirement community, including in total 388 independent living dwelling units for seniors. Um, I'm now op I now open up the public hearing on this application. Um, Councilmember Cohen, do you want to say a few words? Uh, thank you, Chair Levin. I just wanted to quickly uh, thank the land use staff for uh, their very hard work. Raju, Julie. Uh, Jeff, Amy, I uh, want to thank you, Steve, for chairing this and all the members for uh, being here so that we could uh, hear this. I just wanted to thank uh, uh, Dan and his team, uh, Michael and Gary, for all the hard work it's taken, and it's taken a lot of hard work to get to this point, so I'm, uh, I'm very appreciative. I just w also want to acknowledge the hard work of Chuck Merdler at CB8, the support of my borough president, Ruben Diaz, Jr., um, uh, I want to just let everyone know how important I think that the Hebrew home is to uh, to Riverdale, that it is synonymous with Riverdale, that uh, the work that's done there, um, they're the beneficiary of uh, Dove funding from the City Council uh, uh, in support of their nationally renowned elder abuse program. Uh, I've been supportive in capital uh, to try to make sure that the Hebrew home is as safe as possible. Uh, so uh, you're going to hear today about uh, the, uh, the tremendous amount of work that went into incorporating this project into the fabric of the community uh, to make it look like it belongs there, uh, the tremendous preservation of, uh, of open space, uh, the height limitations, uh, and again, really, the, the literal blood, sweat, and tears that went into getting us to this point. So uh, I look forward to the hearing, and I want to thank you again for sharing it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to now ask uh, the committee council to swear in the first panel, Gary Tarnoff uh, of uh, Hebrew Home, Dan Reingold of Hebrew Home, and Valerie Mutterpearl of the Hebrew Home. Um, before answering, please state your name into the mic with the red light turned on. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. I do. I do. Go ahead. Good morning, uh, Chair Levin and, and council, council members. My name is Gary Tarnoff of the law firm of Kramer Levin, Neftalis, and Frankel. I'm here today with Dan Rangel to my right, who is the president and CEO of River Spring Health and the Hebrew Home, and with Valerie Mutterpearl to my left. Uh, who is with Perkins Eastman, the project architect. Dan's going to speak first. We'll tell you about River Spring Health and the Hebrew Home and about the type of long-term care facility that we're planning to build, which is called a continuing care retirement community. Then I will describe the proposal and Valerie and other members of the team who are here are available to answer questions. So let me introduce Dan, Dan Reigold. Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. And uh, to Council Member Cohen, I want to extend our great appreciation to you for your leadership in bringing um, what was um, a diverse group of people together around this project to support it. Uh, the Hebrew Home is j just finished celebrating our 100th anniversary. We were founded in 1917 to help find housing for and, and services for aging immigrants coming to this country. We are one of the last remaining nonprofit long-term care facilities in the city of New York uh, due to a variety of factors, but we are going to be here for at least another 100 years. And we currently serve on a non-sectarian basis 18,000 poor New Yorkers through all five boroughs 
um, through a variety of programs and services, not just the Hebrew home, nursing home in Riverdale, but also through a very wide range of home care services and housing. Um, we have uh, created the, um, and Council Member Cohen alluded to, the Weinberg Center for Elder Justice, which is the nation's first shelter for victims of elder abuse residing in the community. And we work very closely with the City of New York uh, to serve victims of elder abuse who have nowhere to go. Uh, we are developing uh, currently several affordable housing with services for folks in the Bronx on Boston Road and in Arthur Avenue, as well as on Johnson Avenue, where we have a lo very low income, federally subsidized project. And on our campus, Riverwalk, which is a middle income senior project. River's Edge is going to be New York City's first continuing care retirement community. These programs exist everywhere else in the United States, but because New York City did not have the zoning for it, uh, we, they couldn't be built in New York. When the uh, ZQA was passed, zoning was permissible, permissible for um, a, a CCRC, and this will be the first one. We've already gone through uh, approvals by the New York State Department of Health and the New York State Department of Financial Services, both of which oversee this on a regulatory basis, and both of whom unanimously approved the project uh, in March. I just want to point out that this, that, the, that this project is not a real estate project. People who move into a CCRC pay a one-time refundable entrance fee and then pay a monthly fee, which covers not only their living, but most importantly, provides them with long-term care for the rest of their lives. So this life care contract uh, prevents people from having to go on to Medicaid and from having the government pick up the cost of their long-term care. When they leave the facility or, or, or die, their estate or they will get a refundable part of that contract, approx approximately 90% of that fee of that uh, entrance fee will be returned. That is the basic fundamental model. It is an insurance product which provides guaranteed life care. And I, I want to point out that, that one cannot be asked to leave River's Edge if they become financially unable to pay monthly costs. That's part of the review process of the New York State Department of Financial Services. Thank you. Um, this application for a special permit will facilitate the development of a long-term care facility on the Hebrew Homes 32-acre campus at 5701 to 5961 Palisade Avenue in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. The site is split between an R4 district and an R11 zoning district, and the special permit is required to allow this use in the R11 district. The long-term care facility use is as of right in the R4 portion of the site. Let me just add one thing to what Dan said, and that is that the State Department of Health and the New York State Department of Financial Services have already approved uh, the proposed CCRC at this site. Next slide. Uh, in the surrounding area around the Holmes campus, which is so shown on the PowerPoint that you have, uh, let me have this so I can catch the numbers. Sorry. On slide number six, uh, there are a number of institutions, including the College of Mount St. Vincent to the north, the High Ridge Nursing Home, the Sal Salantara Kiva Riverdale Academy, the R Riverdale YMHA, and the Cardinal O'Connor Clergy Residence. Within the 600-foot radius of the site, including the Hebrew Home and not including the Hudson River, institutional uses occupy more than 60% of the lot area. The immediate areas to the south, to the east, and to the northeast of the site feature mostly one single family houses and two family houses. And the sky view on the Hudson development to the east, which comprises three 20 story residential towers and 1,300 residential units at the top of the hill. The R4 zoning district is mapped over the home's north campus, which allows residential, I'm sorry. Uh, which allows residential use at a flooring ratio of, of 0.75. This 8.4 acre, 18.4 acre North Campus was acquired by the Hebrew Home in 1948 and includes nine buildings that provide independent living for seniors, skilled nursing, and assisted living. The South Campus, uh, which you can see on, on 
uh, your slide uh, seven, um, was acquired by the home in 2011 from the Passionist Fathers uh, of Riverdale. It contains a number of small buildings and one vacant four-story, 54,000 square foot retreat house with 91 rooms and a steeple approximately 67 feet above the front lot, yard line. This building would be demolished in connection with the home's proposal. The proposed development would be a continuing care retirement community, the first in the city since the use was defined by the Zoning for Quality and Affordability text that was adopted by this council, I think, in 2014. A CCRC is required to be licensed by the State Department of Health and the State Department of Financial Services, which has happened for this site. To qualify for the special permit, the CCRC must offer a contract with long-term care services and housing for independent living with residential services. The CCRC must also have fewer independent living units than the number of assisted living and nursing home units. Turn to the next slide. The Hebrew Home intends to demolish the existing gold fine building on its north campus, which had 122 skilled nursing beds. Uh, when this application was originally certified, in its place, the, the home proposed three buildings on a one-story base, three wings containing 388 independent living units. The northernmost wing would have been a 12-story building on the north campus with 271 units, which was permitted as of right and below grade parking. The other two wings were located on the south campus within the R11, which is the subject of the special permit, and those would have contained 117 units in a six-story and a four-story wing. As a result of, of uh, the Euler process and consultations with council member, the borough president, and others, and the borough president supported it, we've met with our neighbors and community groups, including the Riverdale Nature Preservancy, the Riverdale Community Coalition, the Skyview, and the Skyview owners, and entered into a memorandum of understanding and, the, and a proposed restrictive declaration uh, to alter the project to make it more acceptable to the surrounding community. Those changes have been incorporated in MOU. The ones that are relevant to land use action have been uh, incorporated in modifications to the application, which is the application that was approved by the City Planning Com Commission. Uh, we agreed that the building on the North Campus would be no taller than the Resnick Pavilion, which is the existing tallest building on the campus, and as a result, and, and to take stories off the buildings on the South Campus. So the building on the North Campus is now 11 stories instead of 12. Uh, it now has two less units. Uh, the buildings on the South Campus are now five stories instead of, of six, <coughs> and three stories instead of four. The total number of units has been reduced from 388 to 386. Uh, uh, council staff has asked us to make additional modifications uh, to the plans uh, to confirm what we've agreed to in the restrictive declaration, and that is that all of the open space on the South Campus will be in, perpetu in perpetuity maintained as open, as open space. Uh, and that will now be incorporated into the plans that we've produced. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the relationship of the Skyview Towers to the Hebrew Home proposed building on the North Campus, which is really below the base, of, because of topography, is below the base of uh, Skyview at 122 feet. And the next slide, I think, shows this information which we've gone over, and the following one is the changes that we proposed as part of this MOU. And let me just briefly go through them. As I said, we reduced the height of the three wings of the building. We increased the number of trees. We agreed to maintain the open space on the South Campus in perpetuity. We will provide pedestrian access to the Greenway if and when that gets built. We agree to provide mechanical screening and green roofs and to establish a community advisory committee to help address design, construction, and post-construction operation. The next slide shows the open space on, on the right uh, that will be, left shows the existing, the lower part shows the open space in the R11 district below the line that will be maintained in perpetuity. This is an exciting project for the Hebrew home. We ask for your support, and we're available to answer questions.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you did cover a lot of what I was going to ask. Uh, could you talk about uh, <clears throat> what you believe will be the impact on traffic and, uh, and Palisade? And well, it's a good question. We have our environmental consultant. We, we, we have done a trip, a trip generation study as to what kind of traffic would result of this. And as part of this project, we're reducing the number of nursing home beds on the, the, the campus from 879 to 607, and that include that is a involves substantial number of of, of staff, uh, and the reduction in nursing home beds will reduce will result in a decrease in people using Palisade Avenue. All some, I think, we show no significant impact at all, and minimal impact in traffic because of the change in the, in the configuration of the campus. Um, the the CCRC is, is as uh, Dan pointed out, is really sort of a, an insurance product, or mostly an insurance product. Uh, how old do you have to be to move into the to the facility? Under the um, state code, this is for people 62 years of age and older. The in reality, the the group that will be looking at this will be probably uh, between 80 and 85, uh, usually with a spouse. And one of the benefits of this kind of a model is that people can move in and um, their care is provided for the rest of their life so that if one spouse has, uh, for example, Alzheimer's disease or a has had a stroke, they can continue to get the long-term care they need while the other person can receive, can be living independently on the same campus and in a connected uh, f facility. The requirement of a, of a CCRC by state code is that it must have as part of its operation, a nursing home and assisted living. One of the reasons that the New York State Department of Health likes this project is because we have existing nursing home beds and we do not have to add any more nursing home beds to what is already an overbedded community. What do you think in terms of people uh, at any given time, what will be the net effect on the population of the campus after this uh, facility is built out? I'm not sure. In between terms of your, between your, I know, you, like you said, you're removing nursing home beds. Do you think that there will be more people on a given day residing on the campus, more people or less people than there are now? Oh, the, the the net number will not, I don't believe, increases. I think uh, I'm trying to do the the math in my head, but we're going from 807, 800, and ultimately we were 875 nursing home beds. We will end up at 600 and. 607. 607. But we're also but changing we're, yeah. 30, we're adding uh, 70 so, assisted living. Right. So we're adding 70 assisted living units, and then we'll be adding the on the north campus 270 independent living and 116 on the south. So there'll probably be a very modest increase in the total population of people being served, but there will be a significant reduction in the amount of staff needed to serve those people, which is where the traffic comes in. Your population will obviously be net healthier because you'll have a lot of people living in. That's right. The independent living folks will be healthier until such time as their as their needs change. Could you just talk about what you think the impact of construction is going to be on the community and how that's going to be done in a way that will try to minimize the impact? But, well, two things. One is we've built four buildings on the campus in my tenure, and we've never had any complaints from the community. Uh, in doing so, we're always very mindful about the community. You'll have um, complaints this time, I can guarantee. <laughs> uh, well, and yeah. no, we, and part of the memorandum of understanding is that we've agreed to a community advisory board that will work with us to be sure that uh, that the, the construction does not interfere with people's quality of life. One one of those things is that we've agreed that there'll be no construction vehicles idling um, on the streets. They'll have to be on campus. Number one. Number two. We've also agreed that we will not park. Um, construction worker cars on our campus, but we will find a suitable location off campus and run a shuttle service so as to minimize the number of vehicles coming on and off those country roads. And that's in a restrictive covenant that the Planning Commission has asked us to put on the property. Okay. Uh, could you, could you, uh, yeah, could just one more time. I know you, you, you talked about it in your, in your statement. Uh, just. The de a little bit of the details of the restrictive deck and the MOU just for everybody here because that was also a very hard fought and uh, you guys really went above and beyond to try to get there. So I think it's worth just belaboring a little bit so that everybody knows. 
I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Gary in a minute. I just want to point out that um, from the very beginning, Council Member Cohen, you have been uh, very uh, protective of the open space in our community, and the Hebrew Home was um, perfectly willing to agree early on to a significant open space commitment, um, which uh, from the very beginning, my, in my experience as the CEO of the organization and having been there for 28 years, one of the things that I knew to be true was that our community really wanted to be sure that there was open space, as, as did we. And so going into this design, open space was a priority. You, uh, in your role as, uh, as our council member, were instrumental in assuring that this would be um, preserved legally, uh, and therefore we entered into a restrictive declaration, which Gary can mention. I just want to point out that when this is done, 90% uh, of the South Campus will be permanent open space. That's 16 acres, 90%. That's uh, 14 acres, yes. Right, so, um, you know, the home acquired this, the South Campus in 2011, and we've had numerous meetings with people in the surrounding area and the communities, gone through many, many different designs, made design changes, had more of the, build, more of the campus on the, more of the buildings on the South Campus, move them to the North Campus uh, so we get as much open space as, as possible. And then during the ULERB process, this, this engagement ramped up and we started meeting even more with, uh, again, the Riverdale Nature Preservancy, the Ri Riverdale Community Coalition, the Sigma Place Association, Skyview, uh, and when you know, we hammered out each individual position to go through what the MOU would be, uh, would require. And it's uh, fairly extensive and detailed, and it has a restrictive declaration that gets, uh, that will be recorded, that's enforceable by, by people who live within the surrounding area, uh, in addition to whatever the Planning Commission does, providing for open space and providing, limiting any kinds of a change. Uh, and uh, it deals with, with with trees, it deals with all the things that we mentioned before, uh, in addition to the open space, and it establishes a community advisory uh, committee, uh, it recalls for green roofs, and, me and mechanical screening, uh, uh, it, it calls for the reduction in the size of the buildings, as we've done, and we've actually implemented all of this by putting it into our land use application, which was ultimately approved by the Planning Commission. Uh, thank you. I know my colleagues are sitting on their edge of their seat learning about this project, so I'll wrap it up. But I, I just want to say that uh, what my colleagues did not see is the, I don't know how many iterations of this project, like it really, I, you really showed a tremendous amount of flexibility and responsiveness to community concerns. Uh, what, what folks are voting on today, or not voting on, but hearing today, uh, will ultimately vote on is not, is a long, you know, many miles travel to get here. Um, the project looked very different when it was or originally conceived. Uh, it was a lot higher on the south campus. Uh, the bulk has really been shifted to the, to the R4 campus. Uh, so uh, it, it really is the reflection, like you said, this started in 2011, um, but really the reflection of a tremendous amount of hard work and really, like I said, partnership and responsiveness to community concerns. So uh, I said this in my opening, but I really am very, very pleased that we got here. Uh, I look forward to ultimately, you know, at the, I guess the next hearing, this will be, there'll be a vote, and ultimately uh, at a vote before the full council in supporting the project. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cohen. Um, I just had one question just about the, um, <clears throat> uh, the framework for uh, the continuing care retirement community um, or life plan community. Um, if somebody, uh, as you mentioned in the in the uh, in the deck here, as, if somebody has a um, uh, is not able to to pay the monthly costs, what then happens to their tenancy? Um, that we under the regulations by the New York State Department of Financial Services, they may not be evicted for non-payment. Um, the um, the way that this the financial model works is that there are actuarial studies that have to be performed to the satisfaction of DFS to show that the financial uh, and economic model is a sustainable one and that will involve that you know people have hopefully have enough assets to to make the initial entrance fee. Um, the Hebrew Home as a nonprofit organization will 
develop um, what I'm loosely calling a scholarship fund in the event that people, to for various reasons, uh, run out of assets or can't maintain the, um, the monthly payment. And, uh, and in addition, we are a Medicaid and Medicare certified facility, so folks that do end up um, uh, depleting their assets can be made eligible for those government programs which we provide to 99% of the people we serve. So people can, can be receiving uh, Medicaid and Medicare and that can uh, contribute to that, uh, the, the monthly fees? Well, they, it would be in lieu of. The, the, if people are paying the monthly fees, one of the beauties of this program and one of the reasons the state likes it is because it keeps people off Medicaid. But if for some reason somebody's finances took a downturn. Go on to Medicaid while they're there. Can get them on to Medicaid, okay. yes. And, and, that, and, then, and they won't be evicted. They cannot be evicted that is according correct. to the regulations with uh, DFS. That is correct. And also our board of directors would not do that. That's a commitment that they've made as part of our uh, nonprofit mission. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do any other members have questions for this panel? Okay. Seeing none, thank you very much. Oh, Councilor Richards. Uh, so there'll be job opportunities. Can you speak a little bit about what your strategy is around ensuring the local community uh, is aware of opportunities at this site? Are you working with Workforce One or any uh, workforce partners on this project? Yeah, we're, we're going to be, this is a new project. This model doesn't exist in New York City right now, and we're very excited to continue to build on our partnerships with um, 1199, with uh, area high schools. We have a program, Councilman, at, um, at our area high schools called Project HOPE. Uh, this is a program that takes high school students, they actually go to high school on our campus and they're nurtured and uh, mentored by our residents to grow a workforce uh, to serve the elderly. We are woefully understaffed in this city. Um, there was an article I think today in Cranes about the home care situation. We are woefully understaffed for what is becoming a booming growth of seniors. And so we're working in very creative ways to develop new job opportunities for young people. Um, there's a need to do that, and uh, we're excited to create new opportunities in that area. All right, I would just suggest uh, probably partnering with Councilmember Cohen to make sure you find, outside of 1199, and I'm very happy there on this project, um, but also ensuring that you work with finding some local workforce partners you can specifically work it with. It would be on. to our benefit to do that, again, because of the, because of the staffing shortages that all health care facilities are facing. Mm -hmm. This is a great opportunity to find mm -hmm. young people who want to get into this field, and I look forward to working with the council member, mm -hmm. um, it, not only in our neighborhood, but also outside of our neighborhood to attract and recruit people to mm -hmm. come into this field. And is there an MBE goal as well? Yes. Okay, what is your percentage? Um, I don't have that. I, I don't know offhand, but we are very committed to that. Okay. Um, oh, have been over the years. Oh, I would think so. Okay. I would think so. All right. Yeah. All righty, so I look forward to uh, hearing more about that as we move forward on this. Great. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Okay, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on this application. It will be laid over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, today we will be hearing <coughs> a number of items we previously held hearings on. We'll be voting, excuse me, we'll be voting on a number of items that we previously held hearings on. However, land use numbers 209 through 213, the Jackson Avenue rezoning applications, will be laid over. We will vote to approve pre-considered land use numbers 246 and 247, the uh, 11 through 14 35th Avenue rezoning for properties in Councilmember Van Bramer's district in Queens. The actions are rezoning from an R5 zoning district to an R6A zoning district with a commercial overlay and a zoning text amendment to apply MIH options 1 and 2 to the rezoning area. Approvals will facilitate the development of an eight-story mixed-use building with approximately 74 dwelling units, of which 22 units will be affordable under MIH. The applicant has selected MIH option 2, but is committed to reaching deeper affordability than is required by that option. Councilmember Van Bramer is in support of this application. We will be voting to modify pre-considered land use numbers 244 and 245, the Variety Boys and Girls Rezoning, Boys and Girls Club Rezoning for property, property in Councilmember Constantinus this district in Queens. These are applications for a zoning map change from R7A 
and R6B to R7X and a zoning text amendment to apply MIH option two to the rezoning area. These actions would facilitate the development of a new residential building and a community facility, which would include approximately 112 units, of which 34 would be affordable under MIH option two. The community facility building would front on 30th Road and, a house, and house a new space for Variety Boys and Girls Club, including a new swimming pool and basketball court. Our modification will be to add MIH option one to the zoning text amendment since the rezoning area is larger than just the development site. Um, Co Councilmember Constantinidis is in support of this application and he's uh, across the street right now chairing an environmental protection hearing, otherwise he'd be here to speak. We will vote to, to modify pre-considered land use numbers 248 and 249, the 3901 9th Avenue rezoning for property in Councilmember Menchaca's district in Brooklyn. The actions are a rezoning from M12 to R7A C24 and a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area on the rezoning area with an MIH option one and two. These actions would facilitate the development of a six story mixed use building with ground floor commercial space and approximately 40 housing units. Our modification will be to remove option two uh, and I believe Councilmember Ranchaka would like to speak on this item. Thank you, Chair. And I want to start by saying, you know, I realize that this application, uh, as small as it is, it has a big, uh, <laughs> big impact for, for me as a council member, second term. This is the first time I'm, I'm in support of and approving the change of manufacturing to residential. So this is a big moment for me. Uh, it wasn't easy, to be honest, um, but we had some really great clients. We had a great team and we worked through it and it made sense. So I can bend, but not break. <laughs> I will bend. Um, this, this application is really exciting for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we're striking the second option. We're, we're really focused on deep affordability here. Uh, I really encourage you all to say yes. Uh, we have a lot of resiliency, some uh, DOT work, and a community advisory board uh, component that allows for feedback to come from the client and the developer to bring back constant conversation and, and dialogue with the community board and the community at large. I'm really excited about this, uh, but I will say this, that like so many things that we're approving, what we're doing right now is setting, setting everything up for success. We won't know that we've reached success until we sit and look at the building and see that the affordability has been met, that the ground commercial floor of a supermarket and all the improvements for a Vision Zero sidewalk happen. So this is the beginning of the middle as we get towards the end and I look forward to working with them. I encourage you all to say yes. Thank you very much, Councilmember Menchaca. Congratulations. Um, our next vote is on land use numbers 214 and 215, the 110th East 16th Street special permit applications for property in Councilmember Rivera's district in Manhattan. The application seeks two zoning special permits to develop a new 21-story mixed-use development on property that is part of a larger zoning lot, including properties occupied by an individual landmark and a theatrical school founded by the noted acting teacher Lee Strasberg in 1969 to teach and promote the techniques of method acting. The proposed new building would use floor area generated by these two properties and the funds received by these institutions would enhance their preservation and growth. The first special permit pursuant to section 74-711 would modify height and setback requirements to modify the street wall requirements and to increase the base height from 85 feet to 230 feet and the maximum building height from 120 feet to 283 feet. It would also waive side yard open space requirements and decrease the minimum distance between buildings. The second special permit is to allow for an automated parking facility with a maximum capacity of 23 accessory parking spaces. We will vote to approve the bulk special permit 
but we will be modifying the application for the automated parking garage to reduce its capacity from 23 to 18 in, the tra in this transit-rich neighborhood of Union Square. And I want to turn it over to Councilmember Carlina Rivera for her remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for permitting me to speak on these land use items in my district. The site in question is 110 East 16th Street, which is located just east of Union Square. The area is known for a diverse mix of buildings of various size and use, some of which date back to the 19th century. This application recognizes this unique architecture and commits to some preservation while constructing a new building that I believe aesthetically works within the context of the neighborhood. This land use action results in the improvement of a landmarked building on East 15th Street as well as an infusion of capital by way of a development rights purchase for the adjacent Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute an iconic cultural institution operating for decades in my district. The application also involves a special permit to include 18 parking spaces, a dramatic change from the 196 spaces that occupy the garage that is slated for demolition. This reduction will clear congestion and traffic that affect these residential side streets and create a block with lovely landscaping. Throughout negotiations, we faced a challenge with this development, which seeks to increase bulk and height in this context without the application of MIH. As I expressed in a letter to the Department of City Planning, CPC must clarify its policy on why MIH does not apply in instances like this project. My community board's borough president and neighborhood leaders find it inconceivable that projects like this, which increase bulk substantially, do not create affordability as a matter of course. Regardless of that fact, our team worked with the developer to guarantee an investment in up to 86 units of affordable housing in the surrounding neighborhood, a 91% reduction in parking compared to what currently exists on the site, community facility space in the ground floor retail, and commitments to restore landmark buildings adjacent to the site. I want to thank the Council's Land Use Division, as well as my team, including my Chief of Staff, Pedro Carrillo, what was important to me and my community partners was that we had a project that considered our local priorities, and I think we achieved that. Taking care of our landmarks, traffic mitigation, and affordable housing are our main concerns. And so even with an investment in dozens of new units of affordable housing in my district, I do want to reiterate my concerns regarding the lack of MIH application to this development and hope for clarity from CPC going forward. With all that, I do ask my colleagues to vote yes on this project, and thank you, Mr. Chair, again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rivera. Um, I want to commend you on the, on the hard work that you put into this application. Um, <clears throat> next, we will be voting to modify land use numbers 235 through 237. The 69-02 Queens Boulevard rezoning for property in Councilmember Holden's district in Queens. The applicant seeks a rezoning map amendment to change the rezoning, rezoning area from an M11 to an R7X with a C23 commercial overlay and a zoning text amendment which would apply MIH option two to the rezoning area. The applicant also seeks a, quote, general large scale permit, close quote, pursuant to ZR section 74-743 to modify regulations regarding maximum building height and number of stories. These actions would facilitate the development of two mixed residential and commercial buildings with 14 and 17 stories and approximately 561 dwelling units, of which approximately 169 would be affordable. I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Holden to explain the modifications. Yes, and that, and that presented the problem, just the, the size of the, the buildings uh, uh, and also uh, the, the number of units for that particular area, which is about uh, at least 0.7 miles from any subway uh, stopped and most of it uphill. So I had concerns. Also, we're down. We were. We actually need 5,000 more school seats in that district, District 24. So, in, in a long process of negotiations back and forth, and I appreciate that the developers uh, put so much effort. We were able to do something that's I, I was told is almost impossible. And during ULERP, the mid, mid midstream, we got. Uh, a commitment for uh, a 476 seat K to 5 school um, put into the uh, complex. 
Also, I was concerned about the number of uh, units that were one or studio or one bedroom, which uh, a family should not live, a family of four should not live in a one bedroom. Uh, so I got a commitment of uh, more um, two bedrooms, and I actually wanted three, but we couldn't get there. But I, I, I'm happy with the number of two bedrooms that were added. Also, we're able to take two stories off each building, and although it still will be larger um, in, than the surrounding uh, buildings, I think the tallest building in the area is about 11 stories, I am I'm happy to report that we're able to get to school, and that does help, and I'm still looking for more sites because we need many more. It, it, it abuts um, Francisco Councilman uh, Moyer's district and also Jimmy Van Bramer's district, so um, I, I, I consulted with them. So I'm, I'm happy at this point uh, to support the project. Uh, we made uh, tremendous progress, especially with the school, and I'm happy that uh, uh, the um, land use division was working with us, and I know I gave them a hard time, at, and I, I apologize, but we did um, come to some kind of agreement just about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so um, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Holden. Congratulations. Is, uh, is this your first uh, large land use project uh, to be voting on? Yes, but it won't be my last, I think, so. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm my condolences <laughs> on that. It is my first, yes, I, I got baptized, thank you. Um, so I'll now call a vote, congratulations. Uh, I'll now call a vote in accordance with the recommendations of the local council members to approve land use numbers 246 and 247, to approve with modifications, with the modifications that I have, that have been described, land use numbers 244, 245, 248, 249, 214, and 215, and 235 through 237. Um, council, please call the roll. All items are coupled for a single vote. Lanceman. Aye. Levin. Aye on all. Reynoso. Aye. Richards. Yes. Aye. Yes. Rivera. Aye. With congratu congratulations to my colleagues, aye on all. You're noted. Gredenchik. The land use items are approved by a vote of six in the affirmative, no negative, and no abstentions, and we'll leave the vote open. We're going to take a five minute recess and reconvene at uh, 10.50.
Okay. Uh, we are back, and I'm going to call the vote uh, on all of the land use items previously referred to. Uh, I'll turn it over to Council of the Committee. Continued vote on land use items. Um, 246, 247, 214, 215, 248, 249, 244, and 245. Constantinides. I vote aye. The land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Okay. So we are going to now uh, have the hearing on. Pardon me. Um, page four. Oh, sorry. Hearing on land use numbers 250, 251, and 252, the St. Michael's Park Elimination Cemetery Land Acquisition Applications for Property at 72-02 Astoria Boulevard in Councilmember Constantinidis' district in Queens. In these applications, the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation is the applicant for an amendment to the city map to demap a portion of St. Michael's Park. Parks are also the applicant for a zoning map change to apply a zoning district designation to the demapped property. St. Michael Cemetery is the applicant for the council's approval pursuant to the New York State Not-for-Profit Corporation law to acquire this land for cemetery purposes. These actions would facilitate the expansion of an existing cemetery. I now open the public hearing on these applications and I'm gonna call Dennis Werner from St. Michael Cemetery and Jose Lopez from the Department of Parks and Recreation and I want to turn it over to Councilmember Constantinidis uh, for remarks. Thank you, Chair Levin, and thank you for stepping in today. Uh, St. Michael's Cemetery is a long-standing institution in my council district. It was first established in 1852 and is one of the oldest nonprofit cemeteries in New York City. St. Michael's is a place that is sacred and special to many of my constituents and residents throughout Queens. Today's application concerns the disposition of 3.24 acres of a parcel of land owned by the City of New York Department of Parks and Recreation that is essentially unus unusable to the public because of its location and shape. The parcel is irregularly shaped, is extremely long and narrow, as ex and it runs along the edge of both the Brooklyn Queens Expressway and St. Michael's private property. There is limited, if any, pedestrian access to this land because its location is directly adjacent to the BQE. Um, you'd have to pull over on the shoulder of the BQE in order to get to use it. It is not parkland. It actually costs us money to maintain it. Um, there, uh, you know, the irregular shape makes land unable to be used for any type of recreational park use. For these reasons, it is completely underutilized and acts at a dumping ground for folks who want to get rid of a couch or a TV, and very often the city of New York is stuck having to split the bill to clean that up. Um, today's application calls for the disposition of this unusable land so that it can be acquired by St. Michael's Cemetery and in due time be put into good use. With this land, St. Michael's will be able to expand its usable cemetery area, which is a need that is absolutely necessary within a big city, but something we rarely talk about. At the same time, the proceeds of this sale will go a long way towards renovating playgrounds in my council district. And you know, I look forward, uh, which, and some of these parks have not been renovated in more than 15 years. So I look forward to taking uh, the proceeds and working with the Parks Department and the Community Board for the appropriate uh, park to receive the funding from this sale that will make sure that the next, for the next 25 years, a park will be better off for this application. Very you know, this application offers the opportunity to dispose of land that has no useful purpose to the city of New York while simultaneously creating new revenues for desperately needed renovations to our playgrounds. This is a small example of how government and the private sector can work together towards creative solutions that benefit the public in more than one way. I strongly support this application and look forward to finally allocating much leave capital improvements to playgrounds in our district that are in dire needs of upgrades and refurbishment while St. Michael's gets the land that they need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Constantinidis. Uh, and I'll now ask the Council of the Committee to swear you in. Before responding, please make sure your mic has a red light showing and state your name. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you'll answer all questions truthfully? Yes. 
make sure that the red light is on, please. Sorry. Right. My name is Jose Lopez. I'm from the Parks Department, and yes, I do. My name is Dennis Werner. I'm the general manager of St. Michael's Cemetery, and yes, I do. Okay. You may proceed with your presentation. As I mentioned, my name is Jose Lopez. I'm the uh, deputy director of Parklands, which is essentially the real estate division for the Department of Parks and Recreation. And I want to say good morning to Chair Levine and, um, and council members. Today, I'm here Today I'm here to present to you an application by the Department of Parks and Recreation for the, um, a zoning for, uh, for the, um, an amendment to the city map and also an amendment to, um, to the zoning map in order to facilitate the disposition of a park parcel to St. Michael's Cemetery in order for St. Michael's Cemetery to expand their cemetery functions. The parcel is located, as you can note here, where it says um, park, is located in the Astoria, East Amherst, neighborhoods of Queens. The parcel is generally bound by Astoria Service Road to the north and 30th Avenue to the south. To the west is bound by um, St. Michael's Cemetery and to the east is bordered by the BQE. The uh, zoning surrounding the, 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 the site parcel is predominantly residential in nature. Um, however, you do have a manufacturing district that is M1-1 that is located west of the project site and to the east of the project site, northeast, there is um, M1- dash, um, manufacturing district that has the um, big box retail store such as the Home Depot, Bath, Bath and Beyond in the Bulova um, Corporate Center. The Sony map amendment that we are seeking will establish an R4 zoning district to the subject parcel. As you may know, zoning designation do not apply to, um, to parkland. The subject parcel was acquired by the Parks Department on April 4, 1941 for park purposes. However, the parcel has never been improved or programmed for open space purposes. And currently, the parcel is landscaped and it has some trees on it, but it's not currently open or in use by the public. Under chapter 399 of 2015, the New York State Senate and Assembly approved the alienation legislation authorizing the city to dispose of the, par of the park parcel specifically to St. Michael's Cemetery in order to expand their cemetery functions. The alienation legislation requires that the city obtain as part of the disposition replacement park land or capital improvements equal or greater than the fair market value of the parcel. The alienation also states that those improvements to be made to parks in Queens. However, as part of the public review process in consultation with the community board and the local council member, they have requested that those parcels be used uh, to make park improvement in their respected district. The Parks Department is committed to working with the local council member and the community board to identify a suitable site to undertake those capital improvements. St. Michael's Cemetery was um, founded in 1852. It is one of the most long-standing cemetery in New York, which is a religious, not-for-profit cemetery that is open to, to all faith. Um, this concludes my remarks, and I'm here to take any questions or comments. Councilor Council Martinez. Just, I, I heard you loud and clear. I, I, you know, we, I look forward in working in consultation with parks to find the appropriate parcel for these dollars to be used. I know there are several playgrounds in our council district that are not too far away, and we've, we've talked about a few already. 
um, that could definitely use these funds for renovation and it be a win-win for our community. Agree. Great. So I, I have your commitment on the record again that these are going to be used only in our council district in consultation with the community board and, and the council member, whoever that is, when it, this is all wrapped up, correct? Yes, sir. Fantastic. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member, uh, and I, I appreciate you coming over from chairing uh, environmental protection. Um, and I know you have to get back to that. So um, I, will, I will leave it at that. I want to thank this panel. I don't have any questions or further questions, but uh, I do appreciate your time and I appreciate the presentation and all the hard work that went into this. And, um, and with that, I will, uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Okay, seeing no, none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Okay, our last hearing will be on land use 254, the second amendment to the Coney Island Special Process Agreement for Property in Councilmember Mark Traeger's district in Brooklyn. This application submitted by the New York City Economic Development Corporation is to amend an agreement signed in 2009 establishing a process for development of the Coney Island amusement area. This amendment is regarding the addition of properties located adjacent to the boardwalk between West 16th and West 15th Streets and on the former street ends of West 15th Street, Stillwell Avenue and West 12th Street, which are either DMAP street ends or were acquired by the city through eminent domain. This property will eventually be mapped as parkland. And now open up the public hearing on this process. Um, we'll be hearing from Will Fisher from New York City EDC and Alessandro. Uh, Zamperla from Central Amusement International LLC, and I will ask our Council to Committee, Julie Lubin, to swear you in. Um, before responding, please make sure the red light is on on your microphone and state your name before you answer. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? My name is Will Fisher. I do. My name is Alessandro Zamperla, and I do. Okay, you may begin. Great. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. My name is Will Fisher. I am a Senior Project Manager of Government and Community Relations at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, EDC. I am joined here on the panel by Alessandro Samperla from Central Amusement International. We are pleased to be presenting before the Subcommittee on exciting new additions to Coney Island's historic amusement district and look forward to answering any questions you might have about the project. The 2009 Coney Island rezoning set the stage for much of the redevelopment that is taking place in the neighborhood today. There has been an additional $180 million commitment towards infrastructure and capital investment from Mayor de Blasio's Housing New York plan allocated in 2014. This includes funding for thousands of units of affordable and mixed income housing, new retail options, and new office space for city facilities such as HRA and health and hospitals. I would like to thank Council Member Mark Traeger for his continued support of these efforts and his continued advocacy for Coney Island in general. Uh, this new development provides economic opportunity for Coney Islanders. New York City Economic Development Corporation is proud to support these efforts by hosting an annual hiring fair in partnership with the Alliance for Coney Island and other local organizations. Um, these fairs have screened nearly 1,000 candidates for uh, seasonal jobs this season alone. In addition to promoting mixed-use development, the 2009 rezoning called for a significant city investment in the historic amusement district to reactivate vacant parcels with infill development. This was designed to support beloved attractions like the Cyclone Roller Coaster and Dino's Wonder Wheel. We are here today alongside our partners from the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation to present plans that complement these investments. We are planning to activate a currently vacant parcel that sits between the Thunderbolt roller coaster and MCU ballpark, as well as DMAP street ends of former West 12th Street, West 15th Street, and Stillwell Avenue that are being converted for entertainment use. In February of 2017, EDC released an RFP for development of the aforementioned parcels. In August, 2006, uh, excuse me, August 2018, we selected Central Amusement International as our preferred respondent. In addition to its compelling proposal for this specific RFP, CAI has made significant investments in the revitalization of Coney Island's amusement district, including Luna Park, the Scream Zone, and new Thunderbolt roller coaster. 
CAI's current proposal includes a new log flume, ropes course, and other entertainment attractions that will further cement Coney Island as the people's playground. This project would be developed and constructed in two phases, with one opening in 2019 and one opening in 2020. The lease term would run through the end of 2027 and would activate approximately 150,000 square feet of city-owned land. The item before you today is an amendment to what is referred to as a special process agreement. This agreement was created as part of the rezoning in 2009 and gives City Council the opportunity to review and approve new leases on certain city-owned parcels within the amusement district. This item before you today is the second amendment of its type. The first amendment approved by Council in 2013 facilitated the construction of the new Thunderbolt roller coaster as, and was also developed by CAI. This amendment will permit the city to lease these additional parcels to EDC, which will in turn sublease these properties to CAI. This project re uh, represents a significant addition to the amusement district, which has seen an incredible resurgence over the past decade. We respectfully request your consideration and approval of the second amendment to the special process agreement and would be glad to answer any questions you may have. I will now turn over the floor to Alessandro Samperla from CAI to describe his company's history in Coney Island and more information on their proposed project. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your time and the opportunity. My name is Alessandro Zamperla, and I represent Central Amusement International LLC. In coordination with EDC and Parks Department, CI is proud to be working to develop and operate additional amusement rides and attractions in the Coney Island Amusement District. Since 2010, CI has been working with its partners at the city to fulfill the vision of returning Coney Island to its glory days of being the amusement capital of the world. Our initial attractions include a number of roller coasters, thrill rides, go-karts, and food service, and we have expanded through agreements with the Parks Department to operate the Cyclone Roller Coaster, BNB Carousel, and like to feature on the iconic Parachute Jump Tower. CAI has surpassed its goals in Coney Island and has helped restore Coney Island as one of the country's premier amusement park destinations. With nine years of experience working in Coney Island, CI has demonstrated great care for the neighborhood context, not only by recreating an affordable amusement park for all ages, but also by strengthening the relationship with the community surrounding the sites. A key goal of CI is to hire locally to create economic opportunities and build a strong relationship with the surrounding neighborhood. We will continue to work with the City of New York and local organizations to provide a local hiring program for these additional properties and to expand and strengthen our relationship with local officials, schools, and community organizations. Finally, CI is one of the key stakeholders in the Alliance for Coney Island, an organization that has brought Coney Island back to the level of its heyday. In regard to the project before you today, I would like to briefly describe the exciting proposal that we have made for the available properties. A map of the following sites is available in the presentation that you have before you. On site B, CI is bringing back the nostalgia from Paul Boyton's Shoot the Shoot that originally opened in 1895 in premiering a new unique flume ride concept. The ride will operate with 12 flume boats that can seat up to six guests at a time, yielding to an hour capacity of 780 people. The track will pick at 40 feet high and will give guests a thrill with speeds of over 30 miles per hour before the big splash. The ride in combination with the station house and decorative lighting will be an excellent activation on the vacant lot. For Site C, CI Vision is an adventure park for those looking to tap into their inner daredevil, which will feature a rope course and zip lines. Site C's location between the Thunderbolt roller coaster and Coney Island Raceway lends itself to the thrill seeker and that is what CI intends to create. Guests can choose from four different roads based on their age and courage. Site D will become an enticing entrance to the wonderful ward of Luna Park, providing guest services and information point and ticketing location. CI will expand on the success of the Warwick restaurants by creating an open concept food and entertainment area. The vision is to create two modern style container food locations with common seating areas for groups of patrons to experience an array of cuisines. Site E has tremendous value in a potential Prudentia public access area. The area nearest the boardwalk will have open air seating for those wishing to have a bite to eat with two food locations or just to get off their feet. 
The rest of this site will be landscaped with a variety of planters and vegetation to create a pleasant pedestrian access point to the rest of the entertainment district and the Volvo. Again, thank you for your consideration of the item before you and we'll be glad to answer any question you may have. Thank you very much. Um, um, so I think we're going to lay this over uh, and allow for Councilmember Traeger to engage with uh, the applicant um, and um, uh, go further on this. Just actually, I do have one quick question. So. Um, uh, is there a sliding scale at all in terms of uh, the cost of uh, the amusement parks, and is that something that's considered under these amendments? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll cost just... to the public, obviously. Yeah. I'm sorry? Costs to the public, obviously, because it's, 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 uh, it's, you know, it's not inexpensive to, to go to, to the amusement park. Of course. I'll, I'll just say to begin that, um, you know, um, given that these are public parcels, we do take affordability to the surrounding community very seriously. But um, in regards to the actual cost, I'll, uh, I can defer to Alessandro. It's really an expansion to the existing Luna Park. So we'll probably integrate it into the, the pricing structure that we already have in place. Okay. And that, is, that, is, that a, is that a topic that's discussed uh, or brought up? by the local community when going through this process, when you go through the community board, is that something that's come up or with the borough president or you know, so on and so forth? Yeah, so um, in regards to um, the actual price in terms of um, kind of, Alessandro, would you be able to describe kind of the, the day structure pass and, and all that? Sure. So Luna Park has uh, two ways of enjoying the park. One is paper ride, so that means you, know, you pay credits to access the individual rides and uh, usually um, for a, a, a ride of dimension of the flume ride will be seven, seven credits to access the, the flume ride. Whereas uh, if you want to enjoy the full day and stay much longer, well, no, we are definitely encouraged and uh, these pedestrian walkways will definitely you know, tend to that. Um, we have a wristband that grants you know, all day access to all the rides and uh, that's where we want to include all these additional attractions as well. Okay. And that's, in, in, but, but there's no sliding scale, in other words, if, uh, you know, lower income participants are not able to access a, a, a lower fee? That's correct, there's no sliding scale. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, are there any members of the public that wish to testify uh, on this item? Okay, seeing none, I will, uh, I will close this public, the public hearing on this application and it'll be laid over. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, uh, we're gonna keep the vote open for 10 more minutes uh, uh, in case any uh, council committee members uh, are going to arrive to vote on the items. Thank you.